All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm excited about this upcoming panel. Um, so first up is Ms. Lynn Farrington, who's the Director of Programs and Senior Curator here in the Kislak Center, where she's developed collections, curated exhibitions, and organized programs for over 30 years. I'm not doing that. Okay. <laughs> She curated Beautiful Blackbird and organized this symposium. On a related note, she curated two exhibitions in 2014 around children's book author and illustrator William Stieg and children's picture book designer Atta Tian and organized a symposium creating children's literature in conjunction with these exhibitions. Last year, she worked with two colleagues, Maylin Perez and Patty Lynn, to develop a collection of children's books around immigrants for the Penn Library Circulating Collection, using the great resources of I'm Your Neighbor books to come up with a list of relevant titles to acquire. She currently serves on the board of directors of A Book A Day. Thank you, Destiny. And I should say, Destiny and I worked together on an earlier project around um, a large collection of women's, women's books, children's books, cookbooks, all African-American, collected by Joanna Banks, who, um, for whom we did a 2019 exhibition, um, which was a lot of fun on, um, on that collection. And we did a wonderful, wonderful symposium right before the pandemic. Um, so we've had a lot of time and now she's graduating and um, we are sad to see her go. Why Black Poets, Ashley and Poetry? I'm gonna read a short piece from Amira Baraki's Black Art, which starts this, um, this essay that I've written for the catalog in which I'm um, giving you a preview of here. We want a black poem and a black world. Let the world be a black poem and let all black people speak the poem silently or loud. My title comes from a sheet of paper with notes for Ashley Bryant's course in African-American literature. And it's in the uh, gallery in case you noticed it there earlier which he taught at Lafayette College in the early 1970s, a separate notebook containing additional notes as well as the outline syllabus for the course is in the, is in the exhibition. This paper that you see here, however, contains a reference to an anthology of poetry edited by the poet and anthologist Oscar Williams. The new pocket anthology of American verse from colonial days to the present published in 1955 was striking to Ashley because it contained, as he wrote, no blacks on any of its 670 pages. This despite Williams's claim that this is the most comprehensive as well as the most representative all American volume of his kind, more than 500 poems by more than 100 poets, a veritable American golden age of poetry. As you can see here, the visuals too emphasize the whiteness of the poets included in, this pa in its pages. It was troubling to Ashley as it is to us to note how influential Williams was as an anthologist. He sold more than 2 million copies of his various anthologies in the 1940s through the 1960s with some republished into the 1970s. A work intended to be read by high school and college students, it would have shaped their conception of American poetry from its inception until today. Williams is aware of other prejudices and explicitly deals with them by omitting poems that might have been included for their historical point of view and replacing them with poems that he judges to have poetic value. Why then was he so blind to the ever greater prejudice and bias and willing to exclude African-American poets completely without explanation. William, Williams even argues in the preface that the 20th century has seen this rapid and spectacular development in the United States. Not only has our poetry become a genuine American expression, it has also due to its endemic character begun for the first time to exercise an influence upon English poets but African-American poets are relegated to invisibility and silence. Perhaps as publishers eager to sell their anthologies to schools, 
in the South, in the North, elsewhere, shied away from any references to African-American culture. Among the excluded voices are those of Phyllis Wheatley, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson, who published his own anthology seen here, Book of American Negro Poetry from 1922. And I love this because on the title page, it says chosen and edited with an essay on the Negro's creative genius. So net recognizing the genius right here on the title page. The poets of the Harlem Renaissance like Langston Hughes, Claude McKay and Georgia Douglas Johnson and he excludes even Gwendolyn Brooks, who in 1950 became the first African-American to win the Pulitzer Prize. None of them had a place here. Ashley immediately recognized the enormous lacuna in this volume, and hence in what poetry was being taught in schools, omitting as it does the voices of African-American poets from the mainstream text used in schools by white and black Americans alike. Poetry was always central in Ashley's life and career. He began reciting poems at school as a child and never stopped as visitors to his home on Cranberry Island can attest. And here you see a scene from when my family first went to meet him and of course sat around that table. And then during the last summer of 2021 when we were visiting. One of the treats of any visit was to hear him recite poems he had memorized years earlier and continue to share. During his very last summer on Islesford, he was often seen sitting at his kitchen table, rereading his favorite Shakespearean sonnets and learning new ones. And he would begin to recite his favorites as soon as there was someone there to listen. When asked by a child how he learned to read poetry, he responded, my teachers taught me. When I was in elementary school, we would study a poem for two or three weeks until we knew it, could just feel from deep inside us what the poet wanted to say. We did that before we were called upon to read it aloud in class. The teacher would help us practice the poem until we could say it well enough that listeners could feel how we felt. Poetry was with him as he made his way through the world, the poets themselves encouraging him to embrace the orality that is at the heart of poetry. As he said, I walked through the woods to the shore of an island off the coast of Maine. Poems are in my head and in the notebook I carry. You would think to see me that I am walking alone, but I feel that poets are with me. They listen, encourage, and respond to the ways in which I practice saying something their poems, uh, saying, practice saying their poems aloud. Reciting poetry aloud remained essential for Ashley because both because of poetry's origins in the human voice and because of the way that its meaning is conveyed through the ear and not just the eye. Poetry like music is rooted in the oral traditions of a people he wrote. Reading through sight only is limited just as it would be if one's knowledge of music were gained only through sight reading or one's conception of painting only through discussion. Performance is essential and therefore it requires the practice that song requires before being heard with an audience. He could envision concerts of literature of poetry, much as we have concerts of the repertory of song. His interest in sharing black spirituals with children is directly tied to his desire to share with new generations his understanding of how poetry and music are in interconnected in African-American culture. Ashley was interested in a wide range of poetry, including the work of Emily Dickinson and the German language poet Rainer Maria Rilke, who inspired Ashley to learn German so that he might read Rilke in the original. For Ashley, a poem exists only as composed. Unlike a story, words, sequences, the ideas in the poem cannot be changed. During his time in Europe in the early 1950s while studying in Aix-en-Provence and traveling extensively in Spain, Italy, and Greece, Ashley developed close relationships with the American poet Robert Creeley and through Creeley, Charles Olson, as well as with the German writer, publisher, and translator Rainer Gerhardt who had discovered contemporary American poetry in the later 1940s and was publishing it. Creeley was impressed with Ashley and even gave him a small handmade booklet of his typed poems in 1952. He used one of Ashley's pen and ink drawings of him as a frontispiece of his first book of poetry, Le Fou, published in 1952. Ashley also met the poet Jack Gilbert who would later win the Yale Younger Poets Prize. 
Gilbert and his girlfriend, Mildred Howell, were part of Ashley's circle of friends while he was in Aix-en-Provence. And Ashley supervised Gilbert in the creation of an illustrated book of poems for Cowell's birthday. Alas, we don't have that, so I can't share that with you. The first book of poetry Ashley illustrated with, with linoleum block prints was Moon, For What Do You Wait, 1967, a selection of poems by the Bengali poet Rapadranath Tagore. However, it was African-American poets that Ashley really wanted to promote across racial lines to children and adults alike. In addition to the work of well-known African-American poets like Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks, he, um, and those published by mainstream publishers. And before I go on, I just wanna say, I love this copy of Langston Hughes' Selected Poems because it just shows you how much he read that book. And, I, and, and when, I, when I saw it, I mean, I, I saw it last summer when we were up there and we were collecting some things and I wanted to collect some of his poetry, some of the things that he was collecting and bring it back down, just, just to have some of that kind of thing. What are his sources? And there's a case over in the corner as you're going to the bathroom where I've put some of the sources that we have, but this ended up at the Morgan in the Morgan exhibition because, and they wanted it so badly. I said, okay, you can have it for that, but I want it to come down here after that because I really wanted it. I love, the fact that the books he had and loved and read show that. Um, I think it's really important to understand, you know, a book that's pristine, it's not very interesting ultimately, but a book that shows somebody's actually read it and read it intensively is, is really exciting. Um, I was gonna go on to say, um, Ashley also collected and read the poetry chapbooks of the Black Arts Movement poets being published by Dudley Randall's Broadside Press beginning in 1965. The works of his favorite poets hold slips of papers, slips of paper with the titles of poems and the pages on which they were located, should he wish to read them to himself or to others. As he said, whenever I go, I read aloud from poetry to share with my listeners an experience of the living poem and to share the work of the black American poets whose fine contributions to American literature are generally overlooked. In 1978, Ashley published a selection of poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, one of the first influential black poets in America. While Dunbar received acclaim for his poems in dialect, Ashley wanted people to recognize Dunbar's mastery of standard English, which he used in two thirds of his poems. Ashley did this by selecting many of those poems to provide a more balanced evaluation of Dunbar's poetry in Ashley's own words. He went on to illustrate books of poetry by prominent poets like Nikki Giovanni, Langston Hughes, and the Jamaican poet James Berry, as well as to collaborate with Jan Spivy Gilchrist on an illustrated edition of her poem, My America. Equally important, he created a compilation of short excerpts from a wide range of poets in Ashley Bryant's ABC of African American Poetry. This influential work, which introduced a generation of children and their parents to the names of so many Ameri African-American poets, appears to have had its genesis in the African-American literature course he taught at Lafayette College. Between fall 1970 and spring 1973, and I don't think this is something that's well known about Ashley, Ashley taught English 47 Black Ameri American poets five times the first class of its kind at Lafayette, a primarily white institution with only a handful of African-American students. According to Peter Newman, a student there who has started college in the fall of 1969, the late 1960s and early 1970s were a time of great activism and change on campus. In fact, Lafayette became co-educational in September 1970, which was the beginning of the first semester that Ashley actually taught there. This ambitious outline Ashley created for the first iteration of the class was trimmed in places and augmented in others as the course evolved. And you can see, you can see this over in the exhibit in the uh, classroom case. Phyllis Wheatley and Nikki Giovanni were consistently paired at the course's opening, followed by Dunbar and the Harlem Renaissance poets, Claude McKay, Jean Toomer, and Langston Hughes, who had a class session all to himself. Women were well represented as well, 
In addition to Wheatley and Giovanni, Ashley taught the work of Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker, Sonia Sanchez, and Lucille Clifton. Ashley used Jan Heitz Jan's Muntu, an outline of the new African culture and its discussion of African and European poetry to develop the philosophical underpinnings for his course. In a letter dated 27 December 1970 to his good friend Eva, um, Eva Brussels Mason, friend of his from his years at Cooper Union and someone with whom he communicated through her whole life. She died around 2010, I believe it is. Ashley writes, one afternoon a week, I'm at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, a two hour trip by bus. He had to take the bus up there to get there. The experience teaching Black American, excuse me, Black American poetry there has been marvelous. I've had a great response from the students. Since most of the material is new to them and generally unknown to others, I have encouraged individual exploration and personal commitment and commitment and response. I've had very lively sessions. And now that I have a stack of term papers to read, I can see that the course meant something to the students. I worked with a group of 24 students, 14 black, 10 white. And at that point, Lafayette had 1,800 students of which only 60 were black. Most of them said when they handed me their papers, we knew that we couldn't give you the usual Lafayette English paper. He writes, good. Next term, I'll repeat the semester scope of the Black American poets. I'll work with some poets I could not get to last term. The success of his course was clear. One student, presumably white, who took Ashley's class in the fall of 1971, wrote to thank him for one of the most profitable courses I've taken at Lafayette. I'm ashamed to admit that prior to the introduction to Black poets I received in your course, I had read only a few works of one or two of the Black poets. Ashley knew that he could find an audience for these poets if he could only share their work. It's important as well that we recognize the poet in Ashley who sought to express himself through the poetic form. In 1940, it was a poem about the creaky stairs he climbed up to his family's apartment. Poems helped him to give form to what he was thinking or feeling. He wrote poems reflecting on eating a plum, waking up in the morning, or being an art teacher to young children. He often wrote poetry as a way of coming to terms with life, giving voice to emotions and thoughts that defy everyday, everyday language. He also published some of his poetry. Sing to the Sun is an illustrated collection of his poems. Beautiful Blackbird, as we know, perhaps his best known work, is filled with short poems which are sung by the birds but read aloud to children. The, the nativity poem that served as the text for Who Built, the uh, Who Built the Stable was written during a trip to Africa. He wrote poems for each of his handmade puppets based on the African derived names he had given them in Ashley Bryant's puppets. And he used poetry to give voice and dreams to the enslaved characters in Freedom Over Me. Finally, poetry had a profound influence on Ashley's prose writings. Since he viewed himself, as primar uh, viewed himself primarily as a storyteller and not simply as an author, he focused on the oral in retelling folk tales and other stories. As he said, at the heart of all storytelling is the wonder of language. Poet poets especially live close to the mystery, the miracles of language. It is the sound of poetry that has opened the vocal range I explore in retelling an African folk tale. The poet's use of language he wrote is tied to the ear and great care should be taken to select the right word for weight, resonance, rhythm, feel, color. Ashley sought inspiration for his African folk tales in reading the work of African-American poets. When I write a story, I use freely the devices of poetry in my prose to dramatize language. I use rhythm, rhyme, alliteration, onomatopoeia. In this way, I hope that even the silent reader will hear the story, sense the presence of the storyteller while reading. This is what makes his books of folk tales resonate with readers of all ages. It makes them such a joy to read aloud. While Ashley, the artist, is often given prominence in exhibitions and discussions of his work, the profound influence of poetry in all aspects of his life remained fundamental. As he said, wherever I go, I read aloud from poetry to share with my listeners an experience of the living poem and to share the work of the black American poets whose fine contributions to American literature are generally overlooked. So 
It's not surprising that he began every program with Langston Hughes's poem, My People, engaging in call and response with the audience. Through the experience of repeating the words of the poem, he united everyone present under the umbrella of my people, his big family. Because for Ashley, as for Langston Hughes, beautiful are the souls of my people. Thank you. Karen, Par Karen Parsons has founded Sweet Blackberry, an award-winning series of children's animated films and books sharing stories of unsung Black heroes in history, featuring narration from stars like Alfred Woodard, Queen Latifah, Chris Rock, and Lawrence Fishburne. The films have screened on HBO and Netflix and are enjoyed by schools and libraries across the country. Parsons' debut novel, how High the Moon, the Moon hit bookshelves in March 2019. She's also authored the picture books Flying Free, How Bessie Coleman's Dreams Took Flight for Sweet Blackberry, and Sweet Blackberry Saving the Day that tells the story of how Garrett Morgan invented the traffic signal. Okay. Oh. Oh, hi, everybody. Oh, um, thank you very much. And I want to say it is such an honor to be here. I've had such a great experience already being here. Lynn, thank you so much. Cynthia, thank you for connecting Lynn and I. Um, this has just been such, this has all been so, um, just an enriching experience listening to everyone and uh, hearing even more about Ashley. I had the good fortune of being introduced to Ashley by my friends, Cynthia and Dan Leaf. Um, and my daughter and I visited them in Maine and they took us to see their dear, dear friend, Ashley at his studio, which is, as everyone knows, either you've been there or you've heard this by now, a magical place. And I felt like I was completely transported um, to the dreams of my childhood there. I, I was so mesmerized by Ashley, the man, um, it was such a, a place of wonder and joy and curiosities and toys and all kinds of everything. And somehow he had managed to keep the child in him alive, which I just, to this day, I'm so moved by. Um, and I think it's definitely, he's gone into me. I was just telling you, I was telling Jan that it's, um, I feel like he's, I was altered after after meeting him, I was changed. Something in me, I'm, whenever I think of him, whenever I look at a picture of him, um, it stirs that same thing inside of me. He was, it was, and it was not just also, when I was talking about his, his studio, for me, it was not just the studio, it was so much about him and how he, um, how he was with myself and with my daughter and with everyone. Uh, he was so full of life and joy and brimming with love and compassion. And my daughter who's 19 now says, she told me recently that it's a day that she will never ever forget. And that joy and celebration of life, we all know we see rush off the pages of Ashley's books into our souls. His books are truly gifts to children and to the child in all of us. Um, in addition to being grateful to have spent the afternoon with Ashley, that one Ash day in his studio and hearing him share stories and recite poems and just being in the presence of the man, I'm also grateful for the doors that he helped open and the extraordinary influence he's had on all who have followed him, followed after him in the children's book world. Um, like Ashley, my nonprofit organization, Sweet Blackberry, aims to celebrate and to inspire. At Sweet Blackberry, we want to present stories to children where they can recognize themselves, where they can recognize their greatness, and they can see and, and get an idea of what they are capable of. I started Sweet Blackberry. Um, my mother was a librarian my entire growing up, and as an adult, um, my mom would call me from time to time and tell me stories that she had come across in the Black Resource Center where she worked, things that she found fascinating. 
And she told me this story one day of Henry Box Brown. I see a lot of people nodding. A lot of people know about Henry Box Brown. This, for people who don't, Henry Box Brown was an enslaved man who literally mailed himself to his freedom in a box um, from Virginia. He mailed himself, it was a 27 hour journey. He got in the box, had it, uh, had the lid put on and nailed shut with uh, postage applied. And he was sent on this journey by wagon, by um, boat, train. And he wound up finally in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania across state lines. And when he um, arrived, he was a free man. When he survived this journey, they opened it up, he was a free man. And he spent the rest of his life telling this story. However, I had never heard this story. And everyone I told about it, my mother hadn't heard it, and everyone I told about it, nobody had heard this story, which I thought was crazy. And I was so bowled over by it that I just, and the fact that I hadn't heard it, that I thought, well, I just have to get this out to kids. It just makes, you know, a man in a box and the mystery and the triumph, the determination, and then this triumph, I thought was so important to bring to kids. Um, it would be a long time before I finally got around to getting, to getting it done. Uh, it was when I was finally um, pregnant with my own child and thinking a lot about supplementing her education and what do they teach kids in school and what can I do? I started thinking a lot about Henry Box Brown, talking a lot about him. My husband finally said, you need to stop talking so much. You need to just do it. <laughs> so, um, so I got to trying to figure out how to make this happen. And like I said, I grew up in libraries with a librarian mother. And so of course I wanted to do books, but I didn't know how at the time and self-publishing wasn't what it is today. So I just couldn't figure it out, but I met an animator and what I was able to do was to make little short animated films for children that told these stories. And so I wrote them and I, I was able to um, recruit some wonderf wonderfully talented people, including R. Gregory Christie, the illustrator, for those of you, some of you might know Greg Christie, um, to do the illustrations. Uh, he's he's a, an incredible Coretta Scott King award-winning um, children's book author, but he came on board and um, actually, let me show a little clip right now, if I can. There was a study first conducted in the 1930s called the Kenneth Clark Dolly Experiment. Children were given two dolls, a white doll and a black doll, and they were asked a series of questions. Which one is pretty? Which one is nice? They're asked these questions, which one is bad? In recent years, they conducted the same test, and the results were exactly the same. Why, why do you want that skin color? I just don't like the way brown looks because the way brown looks looks really nasty for some reason, but I don't know what reason. They're such little kids. They're so small. And they're already, the messages that they're getting from the media or outside of them is that they are bad. I founded Sweet Blackberry to share stories with children that I discovered that we just don't hear about. incredible little known stories of African-American achievement, stories that could inspire and empower them. We present these remarkable stories of individuals in history through animation in an engaging and fun way. Pulling children in and at the same time showing them that obstacles are actually opportunities for greatness. Sweet Blackberry is presenting positive images of people of color, true stories to help build a child's self-esteem and show them what they're capable of. We've told the awe-inspiring stories of Henry Box Brown, an enslaved man who mailed himself to freedom in a box, as narrated by Emmy Award-winning actress Alfre Woodard. I want to tell you a story. The story of Garrett Morgan, who invented the traffic signal, as told by Oscar-nominated actress Queen Latifah. Some think you're just dreaming, mind floating up high, but I see that there's more there, one who questions why and Janet Collins, the first black prima ballerina as told by Emmy Award-winning actor Chris Rock. Though each dance she loved, 
she could easily say that she had a favorite, and that was ballet. And many other talented people have come on board to help us tell these stories. I'm really proud of Sweet Blackberry and what we are. And every time I talk to people about it, the response is overwhelmingly positive. Everyone is very supportive and recognizes that this is something that needs to be out there. We've had an outpouring of support from parents, educators, and organizations, and have won numerous awards. When I have the opportunity to visit schools and I see the kids' faces, it makes it all worth it. I get to see firsthand the impact that these stories have on children. And we've barely scratched the surface. There are so many more incredible stories to share. Be a part of it. Join Sweet Blackberry and let's get these stories told. It's love, it's love, it's love, it's love, it's love, it's love. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a, it's a kind of an old clip. I'm happy to say that since it was first created, that clip, we have produced, um, we produced an animated film about the first Black female aviator, Bessie Coleman, called Flying Free, um, narrated by uh, actor Lawrence Fishburne. And we've also published, finally, we have published two kids' books. Uh, Little Brown has come on board, and they've been publishing the Sweet Blackberry stories um, as books, which is what I wanted all along. Um, and so we have uh, the story of Garrett Morgan uh, called Saving the Day. It's actually out out there, you can see it, as well as the Bessie Coleman Flying Free were both made into children's um, hardcover picture books and also still illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. And, um, and as we know, and I, you're hearing here, um, thankfully in recent years, I think it's been really brought to everyone's attention how important and how overdue it is to tell these stories. And many people have stood up and have responded and we're seeing more and more stories like this for kids. Um, I'm happy that Sweet Blackberry can follow Ashley's lead in empowering our children and filling them with joy. Thank you so much again for letting me, for allowing me to be part of this celebration. For more than 30 years, Ashley Bryant. Oh, how do I stop it? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. For more than 30 years, Ashley Bryant and Jan Spivy Gilchrist shared stories and ideas, but mostly laughter and love. Dr. Jan Spilby Gilchrist is a fine artist and illustrator of 106 award-winning children's books. She enjoyed traveling to Isle Ford, Maine, the island that she commonly referred to as Ashley Island. They then developed a deep friendship and a book, My America, and a book, My America by Gilchrist, grew from that relationship. Um, I think it's better if you sit over here, maybe, but you'll be able to see what's oh, okay. up there. Yeah, let's do it like that, because people won't be able to see you <laughs> from your back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's good. Yep. I, it'd be 35 years ago or more, I met Ashley Bryan at HarperCollins in New York. He was working 
I had heard about him, of course, but I had never seen him. But he made me feel guilty first time I met him because I was making excuses why I couldn't work because I was traveling. And Ashley was traveling everywhere in the world. But he was working on a book in the hallway at Harper House. And that was how he talked to me all the time. As a matter of fact, when he first came to my home to visit, he made my husband build me a studio because I grew up in a family of 14 children. So I never had a studio or didn't, most of the time I didn't even have paints, but I used to sit on the floor and work. But when I actually came to visit and I was working, it's not, he said, I'm still looking. He, the next day he was walking around the house and he said, where's your studio? And I said, I kind of work everywhere, all over the house. And he made this man build me the most beautiful <laughs> studio ever. I mean, it's like glass and, and I'm sitting outside because he, he, he went to him and said, she has to have a studio. And every time I go in there, you know, I tear up. But I, every year from that point on, I traveled to the island to give him a dollar store birthday party. <laughs> we live in Illinois, so the journey was a journey that I looked forward to. We had, sometimes we went through Canada, sometimes we went through Boston, sometimes we traveled uh, upper state. And if it wasn't for my wonderful husband, I probably wouldn't have been able to see him because I wouldn't have been able to take the trips. So the the thing that I was happy about was when we first, when I first took my husband there, he fell in love with Ashley too. So that, I kind of knew that was going to happen because every time I took somebody to visit Ashley, they fell in love with him because you can't help it. There's no way you could visit him and not. So when I um, had him um come and travel around in the states with me i could be so proud because i couldn't understand why he knew me i just couldn't understand why every time ashley left the island he called me first and i was thinking how do, everybody in the world knows this man it was almost like his eye is on sparrow you know the whole thing like why does he know? And, and not only know me, know my birthday, because my birthday, I was born at midnight on the 15th of February, on the 14th. But my birthday is February 15th, so I was born at midnight. And he knew my birthday. And I'm like, why? Because I thought of him as kind of like a messiah, because everybody knew him. I could stop anywhere in any state or any city and I could mention Ashley Bryant, and they knew him. I, um, so when it came time for me to ask him a favor, and that favor was I wanted to do a book. I wanted to do a book that, oh, so some of these paintings I'm looking at because I, I own some of them. The, I have the painting, which is huge, of the puppets. I have the only painting of the puppets. And I don't have it because I bought it. I have it because he said, I want you to have this. He was the most giving man. I said, I can't just take this painting. He said, I didn't ask you. So while he's talking to me, while he's telling me that I can have it, he's rolling it up. He, he's taking it off the wood and he's rolling it up. And then he take, he does, he's taking it to the post office on the island. It's mine. It was just the way he was. This is also mine. <laughs> but we started to collect them if every chance we get. But you can't collect Ashley because everybody wanted them. So he, he, you almost had to get it that minute on the island. But we, so I actually went to my publisher, Phoebe Gay, and asked her if Ashley and I could do a book together. Well, I'm an illustrator and he's an illustrator. She didn't understand, what would you do? 
And I said, I'd like to use as a subject from which to speak this afternoon, the other America. And I use this subject because there are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful. Jean had become very friendly with Ashley Bryan, who is another super talent in the children's book world. He is an um, amazing artist, amazing writer, professor. He thinks he speaks six or seven different languages just right off the cuff. And he lives on this wonderful island that he said he went to after, right after the war, World War II. And his house is amazing. The ocean is amazing. When my father died, I said to Calvin, my husband, I, I just want to go to the island and just talk to Ash. She got the idea of doing the book we do together, but neither one of us would see what we were doing. She wrote the poem, My America. This is actually a poem I wrote based on my son, who was a student ambassador. And I called up my editor and said, I would like for Ashley and I to both illustrate this book. The cool idea she had, Ashley, in addition to being a wonderful writer, is also a super talented artist. And the idea was that both Jan and Ashley would contribute their art for this book. And we decided we would not see what each one was doing. Then he was actually working on this book in Africa, and I was working on it here. We never saw our art because we illustrated the same words, which had never been done before. And it just seemed like such a cool idea to work with artists this way. Here's the title page. Again, Jan's art and uh, Ashley's art side by side. And what we also loved about this idea is, you know, our country is so diverse. And we just thought, you know, you know, okay, maybe it's a little obvious, but why not show the range and the depth of diversity by having two artists who are uh, looking at Americans, looking at the American landscape, American wildlife, obviously, you know, they're gonna have their own interpretations. Laura Bush, uh, the first lady, Laura Bush, selected that book as one of the books for that year. So we were, I was invited with um, Ashley Bryant to come to the White House to a ball. And then the next day, we went to breakfast, first lady, and did all these things. Ashley and I read the book on the White House lawn. And it's actually, you can see it on a webcam. It's been there since 2007. I hope you make a good movie. <laughs> they did one of me called I Know a Man. Not yeah, everybody. they've been showing it around. I've, every, I've bought the theater around. You did? I bought it out and gave it away. Oh, yeah, you wrote me about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they didn't did. know you. No, yeah. nobody. Oh, yeah, they did. Everything. We know each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's our fame, knowing each other. <laughs> oh. Here, over here, say when people ask me how they're fantastic, terrific, great, all day long. Hooray! She said, don't go into where I have a little headache or I have a twinge here or there. Whenever, how are you? Say, fantastic, terrific, great, all day long. Hooray! And I taught that to a number of friends on the island. And people would hear us where we would care trying it out. So before we went to bed every night, he taught me how to say golden dreams. Sonia Dora. So I'll say Sonia Dora. Good night.
Yeah, just stay there. That works out perfectly. Okay. Okay. Cool. Would, would you All right. Thank you all for um, that beautiful panel. I'm just going to jump right into our first question, which is for everybody or whoever wants to answer. So one of the themes of the panel, as I understand it, seemed to be um, representation and in particular representation for um, Black children and Black young people um, because of his work, even at not just as an author, but as a teacher. Um, and so one of the things I'm curious about, um, if y'all can speak to, is um, what is it about Black storytelling or the traditions of Black um, storytelling that you see in Brian's work um, and that you find significant for your own work? So that includes like the work that you're doing with Sweet Blackberry. Oh, well, Sweet Blackberry. I mean, well, with, with Sweet Blackberry, really, the the idea most importantly is to get stories and and um stories and representation to kids um that i feel like aren't out there so much uh and we need to have more and more of i'm happy to see that we're starting to we're seeing more of it now but that's the whole the whole idea is for kids to be able to see themselves and for for black and brown children be able to see themselves but for all children to be able to recognize the value of their neighbors you know too through these um accomplishments and in incredible contributions that people have made that have been um overlooked or denied um completely and that i mean that's really the idea with sweet blackberries to get those stories out to kids and i think it just changes so much I think when you introduce these things to kids early, even if you're just, you're telling them these stories, you're planting the seeds about people and relationships and tell, and also empowering them, making them feel like, real, recognize what they can do, what they're capable of doing, that they are strong. And these people came before, this person looks like me, I can be that. And, um, and it makes them, it makes them strong and it makes them, thank you. Um, it makes them, you know, it, it empowers them. And I think that that's so important. I also think that it, it changes the landscape of race for children when you introduce these things to them early, you know, for, for all children. Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the things that strikes me about Ashley's work is his interest in cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot about cultural heritage. And I think it comes out in the exhibit as well. I tried to tried to point to that in the exhibit so that the walls um, sort of reflect some of that. But I think he wanted to, to give children a real sense of what that heritage was and why it was important and how varied it was because it wasn't all one thing it was a lot of different things and so you know he does the afro-caribbean tales and he does african folk tales and he does proverbs and he looks at um he looks at african-american poetry and he looks at spirituals and all of these things work together to give you a bigger sense you know it isn't just one thing or another you know um his the history is not one Thing only it's all these things and in terms of when he's looking at African folk tales he's looking at different ones from different groups of people different cultures within Africa so he's trying to capture that multiplicity of what it is you know that we are all of us you know we're not one thing but we're all we're an amalgam of lots of things and I think he brings that to the fore in the work that he was doing and he allowed and in fact he opens the space for the kinds of things that Karen and others that have been talking here today are able to do so I think and that's another way in which he was very very important I'm taking my time okay I'm sorry um, what he did was teach in all the time. He was teaching through his work. He was teaching through his presentations. With the children, he wanted them to know, he said, every time that he was out or we were traveling together or whatever, 
he would say to the children that you should know everything about yourself and love yourself. Complete that as much as you can and then share it with the world. I thought that was just an amazing thing because he was so giving, but he was teaching children how important it was to give. And so you can study everyone else, but if you left yourself out, you had done yourself an injustice. And he would, he would do that. Thank you. So um, I collect Black children's books, but I joke sometimes that like one of the reasons I collect Black children's books is because I can't really afford to collect art. And so I think of Black children's books <laughs> as visual art that I can afford to collect. Um, so one of my questions for y'all is, um, I guess why, and then, and especially, I'll, we'll start with you. Um, why the children's book is almost like a kind of a medium um, for a black artist? Like, why is that? Why is that a significant space um, for you? I didn't know, and I never left the little girl that lives inside me. She's still there. And so all the questions and all the things I didn't understand, I I keep them. And so when I'm thinking about children, I didn't know, any, I was an artist since I was born, my mother said. I was always painting. I, my father was a pastor. He had all these Bibles and all kinds of books. And I used to go in and try to copy the paintings. <clears throat> I didn't know why, but I just needed to. So I understood that artists' children need art. So because I, because I, I couldn't live without it. So when, um, I'm, it's a medium because, like you said, I I'd had gallery showings that were very small. Black artists weren't in on West 57th Street. I happen to have gotten lucky and, and got there, but that's not common place. To, so you weren't in galleries. You weren't showing there. And so the... I know that my art came from my father's Bibles, so they were books. So I knew that there were books that contained art. And so when I learned that, you know, like the teacher, and you're looking at a book and it has art, well, the first question was, where does art come from? Who's doing this? And then I found out we were, that we actually could, and that when the, I used to, I was physically challenged. So I used to sit on the porch and the chill, I couldn't play with the children. They would come over because I fascinated them with art and I fascinated them by drawing them. And so they would watch the art. So I was stealing from them. I was stealing their attention. I was stealing their love. And I, I did, I was, I gotta say, I didn't mind. <laughs> I was a rat. And I, and I wanted them in my life and I, get, I was able to use my art to get them there. So that's what the books did because when I, and I was a teacher, you know, I was a school teacher also. So I know I could use art for that, for that. So the illustration is a fabulous way to teach art to children, picture books. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the interesting things to realize people often valorize painting or paintings, but often, you know, prints or, you know, or something that's, you know, children, the illustrations and things like that. And in fact, when you think about it, how do we really, most of us come to these things originally? Most of us don't live in houses with lots of art necessarily around us or didn't start out that way. We may have some now because we, we've fallen in love with these things, but we always had books or the books themselves were that form with which we, we engaged with, with art. You know, So, I mean, the importance of picture books for that reason, because of the way in which those images really speak to us. I mean, people remember those kinds of things from their childhood and, and they, they inform who they are as adults. I don't know what to say after all that. Uh, you know, for me, I would just, I mean, all I would say, I, it was beautiful hearing what you guys had to say, is just that for me, I think I, you know, I mentioned before my mother was a librarian. I was really lucky I and mean, I was an only child. So I spent a lot of time being babysat by the library. And I think I was 
for me, I was just so, I was immersed in that. I'm not an illustrator or artist, um, but I, but I got to get, I got to have that. I got to have that around me um, a lot. I was very lucky that way. Okay, we want to open it up to the audience for questions. Ms. Copper has a question. I would just like to say that to be surrounded by all these people who love art and who've been nourished by Ashley we are the members of a special country. Mm -hmm. But this country is bigger than we even know, because even when we go somewhere else, the name comes up. Or asking somebody what their favorite children's book is, and suddenly a face lights up. And I just think of all of us here, we are literally holding hands. And we're always going to be holding hands. Just remember that when you go out in the difficulties. And when I went with Ashley and Sandy to the Coretta Scott King breakfast, there was a writer there, another writer getting a prize. And he told his story how it took him eight years to write his book. And then he looked out at all the librarians and the writers and the artist, and he said, now I'm talking to my two girls. You too, and the girls were there listening to his dad. Just remember, I can't protect you, what you're gonna find out there, but I know that everybody in this room is gonna be there for you and help you get ready. And that's what Ashley did for us. I'm going to change the subject. I mean, you guys were great, but uh, <laughs> representing the Ashley Bryan Center, our mission was to deal with his legacy and find a, a home for all those hundreds of thousands of things that he owned. And uh, how we ended up at Kislak, I'm not, well, I do know. We asked for proposals. We asked for we asked for proposals from major universities around the country, and we got plenty of them. And uh, the one from the Kislak Center was so much better. It was it was so unanimous amongst our our board. Uh, there were ten letters written by department heads of the university uh, saying how important it would be. And uh, we, we came here, and first of all, the physical facility, I mean, I went to Penn, and all I can think is this is the most beautiful piece of real estate on the campus, and they gave it to people doing legacies. And dead work. I mean, they must be pretty good. Uh, everything they've done has been perfect. And Lynn Farrington is spectacular. Thank you so much. And the staff here, and John. <laughs> of course, John. He's always there to help. <laughs> well, should we conclude? We should. We'll be, we're pretty much on time. Wonderful day. Wow! Thank you, everyone. Thank you.